With the rumoured release of Tool's highly anticipated next album set to usher in a new age of darkness as the Great Old Ones rise from their tombs to devour all the prog metal fans, now seems like an excellent time to talk about one of my favourite bass riffs of all time, Rosetta Stone from Tool's 2000... 2006? Fuck me, Jesus, I was 12. Uh, 2006 album, 10,000 Days, is one of the most pants-moistingly awesome bass riffs of all time. You know, this one. So what in the name of Maynard's overpriced wine is actually going on with this song? Well, I'll tell you, but first... We gotta do some maths, yo! Yes, maths, for you see, this entire song is built on some dark, unholy magic called a polyrhythm. In this case, specifically, a 5 against 4 polyrhythm. What's that I hear you say? What's a 5 against 4? What's a polyrhythm? Why is your floor covered in live badges? Well, I'll tell- <laughs> Well, simply put, a polyrhythm is two rhythms composed of different subdivisions or groups played at the same time, creating what sounds like two distinct voices that cascade over each other and create a great deal of syncopation and rhythmic intrigue. You're basically playing notes of one subdivision and then taking a completely different subdivision and playing that over the same bar. Eventually, all the notes are going to land back together at the start of the next bar. This way, you can have a bar of two evenly spaced quarter notes and three evenly spaced triplet quarter notes. Side note, you can also make polyrhythms out of more than just two patterns, but this is reserved for veteran proggers and various forms of advanced octopi. So, how do we even polyrhythms, bro? Well, polyrhythms are written out in the form of ratios, like this. So here we have our ratio, x, y, or x against y, or x over y, they all mean the same thing. Let's start by putting some numbers into this. This number here on the right is going to be the main beat we play, in this case, two beats. And this number on the left is the number of notes we're going to play in the same space as these two notes, in this case, three. So, if we play a triplet pattern over these two beats, you now get this pattern. We call this a hemiola, which is also, incidentally, what you get if you combine a seamstress with a character from Ultima 7. Hey! You can hear that while the two patterns do combine together to create one cohesive rhythmic part, you can also hear the two individual voices playing a steady pulse. For example, here you can hear the two as the main beat. One. Two, one, two, one, two, one, and now the three. Two, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. This three over two, or more commonly two against three polyrhythm, can be heard all over the place, with my favourite example being from renowned folk duo Simon and Disturbed. Did I do it right? Is that... Is that, is that how the meme works? So, technically all polyrhythms are just built up of different subdivisions, but I find an easier way to internalise a lot of them is by thinking of them instead as different groupings of 16th notes. They're all going to end up with the notes in the right place. It's just, like, different perception, man. What am I doing with my hands? We've already looked at two against three. Let's move on to the next most common polyrhythm we find, four against three. So, if we have three quarter notes as our main beat. This means we're going to have three groups of four sixteenth notes. To get four notes to equal the same space as three quarter notes, we're going to have four groups of three sixteenth notes. It's pretty cool. The number of notes in the main beat, three, is the number of sixteenth notes in the other group. We've got four groups of three sixteenth notes and three groups of four sixteenth notes. Basically, your right hand is counting in four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And your left hand is going to be counting in three. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Put them together and you've got your polyrhythm. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So this gives us a pattern in three, four. But you've also probably heard this pattern a whole bunch in four, four music as well. Generally, we'll take the three, four part and then add a little tag or extra beat at the end to make it a full bar of four, four you're generally going to hear this more than you are continuous bars of 3-4 with this polyrhythm over it. For example, you've probably heard this before. That's right, the Bo Diddley rhythm is just a 4 against 3 polyrhythm with an extra added at the end. You hear this all over metal music as well. For example, the start of the chorus from Icarus Lives by Periphery is that same rhythm again. Did you hear it? Here it is again. Really listen for that 4 against 3 pattern. The fuck was that? 
In a lot of metal, particularly with bands like Meshuggah, you'll sometimes see that the patterns will go over bar lines. Well, with the snare still playing on two and four over the bar of four four, this creates a really cool sounding polyrhythmic. <gasps> but, but I was going to talk about polymeter just when it when it becomes relevant later, later on. That was weird. A lot of the time in pop and rock music though, we're not actually hearing polyrhythms as two individual beats or voices, but instead as one pattern, which is the composite of the two rhythms combined. Polyrhythm can therefore be especially effective when used with counterpoint to really highlight the clear distinction between the two pulses. But enough of that bollocks, how do we get from this? To this. Well, it's time to look at the riff actually advertised. Let's look at the drum and bass breakdown from Rosetta Stone by Tool. So what polyrhythm is happening here? Well, our first clue is going to be look at the drum part, specifically the bass drum part. Minus a few little embellishments, we can see that the bass drum part is actually playing this repeated pattern, which, when combined against the hands, is actually a five against four polyrhythm. Because threes and twos aren't prog enough. We need to count all the way to five for this one. So how does four against five work? Well. Let's use the same method we used with the 4 against 3 pattern. We take the 4 beats made up of the group of 5 16th notes and 5 groups of 4 16th notes and by playing only the first beat of every group we get this. Playing with the good old knees we can hear these two distinct patterns. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. That's pretty cool, but it's not exactly what the drum and bass part are doing. They're actually doing this. So, what's happening here? Well, I'll tell you, my young polyrhythmic Padawan. We've taken a group of five sixteenth notes and split them into a group of two and a group of three. If we take our group of five sixteenth notes here and we play an accent on the first note and an accent on the third note, you'll really start to groove. If we remove all the extra unnecessary notes, you get this. Now, that's basically all there is to the pattern, except this is tall, so it was never going to be that easy. So for starters, while this 5 pattern is going on in the bass and drums, the hands are actually playing in 3-4. So the bass part actually looks like this. Yeah, I know I've put it in D minor, let's get the rest of the songs in D minor, but there's a little part takes a brief excursion in G minor, but it's just on one chord and we're hanging out, so it was a brief bit of modal interchange rather than a proper modulation, just chilly over in G minor, don't drop about it. But that's not all. The bass part is also playing notes that really accent the three fouriness of the part. So really, this is actually an example of polyme- Oh no! Well, that takes care of that. But before anything else goes wrong, I should probably talk about polymeter. Polymeter is heavily linked to polyrhythm, but they're not quite the same. Polymeter is built on using two different time signatures at the same time. So I might have a group of three quarter notes against a group of four. So polyrhythm is taking a pattern of more notes and filling it into the same space as a pattern with less notes. Whereas polymeter is two patterns of the same subdivision played at the same time. So they eventually land back together after several bars. But that's just how I've understood it. I could be talking completely out of my ass, so feel free to contact your local branch of the Evil Council of Theory Nerds to have them burn me at the stake for heresy. With that, we can finally look at what Justin Chancellor's actually playing. We can see at a glance that the first big thing is there's notes here that aren't just this low G. So, what are they then? First bar, he goes up the octave to the tonic, G. Bar two, we have the flat seven, F. Then the flat six, E flat, which is the real giveaway that this little passage is in G minor and not D minor, as this would be an E natural in D minor. Finally, he plays C, the fourth, and B flat, the flat three, to bring us back to the top. So that's what's happening melodically, but why are the fancy new notes placed where they are? Well, they're all placed on beat three, which is really highlighting the fact that we're in three four, as this brings us nicely to the start of the next bar. Think about how, when you take ballroom dancing lessons, the instructor will give a little raise in her stern Russian voice when you get to the three, as a way to lead you back to the one, the downbeat. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Not that I've ever taken ballroom dancing lessons. I mean, why would I, why, uh, why would, uh, fucking Slayer! Fucking Slayer! 
So he's putting notes on beat three. This is super easy to do on bar two and three, as the pattern already has notes naturally occurring on those beats. But what about these other bars? Well, you know how we had this pattern with all the accents and then we got rid of them to create our bass drum pattern? Well, all he's done is put one of them back in so that we can still have a note on beat three and keep the descending pattern going. So on bar one, this extra note lasts an eighth note, but on bar four, it only lasts a sixteenth note so that the five four pattern can keep chugging along. Damn, that's super smart, wowee. The climax of the whole section for me is when the percussion part starts playing straight quarter notes over it. It just grooves like a motherfucker after all the syncopated drum stuff that's been going on. This part is so good, it's actually already done. They, they did this before on The Grudge, on Lateralis. Hey, if it works, it works. So that's what's actually happening here, but how the heck are you gonna practice this? Well, you could do what I did when I was 15 and brute force it. Walking around the house, singing the part back to yourself like you're trying to communicate with Satan via Morse code. Oh shit! Or we could try breaking the riff down and slowly building it up. Firstly, I found it really helpful to internalize the polyrhythm by doing the knee slapping thing. And the best thing is, you can practice this anywhere. On the stairs, in a tree, in a vastly superior Adam Neely video, but this will really help get the five pattern and its relationship to the coordinate beat in your head. Next, play the five against four pattern on your bass, along with the track or just to the click. Finally, go bar by bar adding in the additional notes. It really helps not to rush to play the whole pattern, but just focus on one bar at a time. First bar, then add the next, and then add the next. It's really not too hard, just watch out for this E-flat in bar 3. I found I was always rushing to play this as an 8th note like the other two, but it's, it's a dotted 8th note, or 3 16th notes worth. Finally, you should have it sounding something like this. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a like. Uh, if you want to see more stuff like this, or you want to see more solo bass covers, please consider subscribing. Um, leave a comment if you thought I have a stupid face and I'm not funny, or if you want to suggest more things for me to do. Um, yeah, thank you. See you next week.